This to an Irish audience. You can contact us on Twitter at iProperty Radio or by email at hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Your host today is Carol Tallow and myself, Brian Fox. Okay, today we'll be joined by Tom Gray, Research Fellow at Trinity House in Trinity College, Dublin. And he's going to talk to us about um, people-centred design and housing for our ageing demographics. So, Tom, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. We met last week at a very interesting event hosted by Trinity. It was um, a bit of a roundtable discussion on uh, deep, deep um, tech for the building industry and for the built environment. And you're involved with some really interesting research at the moment. So you might just tell us a little bit about um, the, the work you're doing and the research you're doing at the moment. OK, so first of all, we're a research centre um, as part of the, the School of um, Engineering in Trinity College Dublin. And we're very much focused on, well, sustainability and people-centred environment, I guess, is what we do. So, um, but really, when we look at people-centred design, we're talking about people designing for people completely across the age spectrum. Okay. And look, we know that that's important. You know, the, the, the Radio Show and Podcast here has been running for about 11 months now, and there isn't a month that we haven't discussed, you know, the lack of range <coughs> of property options. We just... Traditionally, we just didn't seem to cater or was it a case that because Irish people don't move as often as maybe some of our European counterparts that we tend to, you know, we tend to think that wherever you are, it has to do you for for life. Yeah, and I think, well, you could, when you talk about property and housing, mm. that's one thing. And maybe we'll get onto that in a couple of moments. But I think we don't design for ageing in anywhere in the built environment. Mm-hmm. So whether we're talking about urban space, whether we're talking about cities, whether we're talking about healthcare, particularly the likes of hospitals. Um, there's an expression in, you know, when they talk about universal design, which is another area that, again, we can, we can touch on. You know, that the world is designed for you know, middle-aged white men uh, or, or, or certainly relatively fit, able-bodied white men. And is that because they're the people who are designing it by and large? Uh, by and large, but I think also, you know, there's a complexity to designing the built environment. And if, you know, if you can focus on one particular user group, it makes that task a lot easier. If you start considering, you know, the built environment in terms of catering to the needs of a three-week-old baby up to a 95-year-old uh, adult, mm. then... That's hugely complicated, mm-hmm. and I think it makes things very difficult. And like a lot of expertise um, in whether it's architecture, planning, urban design, engineering, we've become quite specialised, and I think our buildings have become quite specialised. So it's it's not just about housing and not designing for ageing and housing. It's it's completely across the built environment. Okay, well, you're well placed to look at this because your background is in architecture? That's correct, yeah. So I was um, uh, graduated from architecture in Bolton Street all the way back in 1998. Uh, and we I still call it Bolton Street <laughs> and not... Uh, T-U. You know, T-U-D or whatever. So um, it's, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I think the architectural profession, along with other building professionals, you know, there's such a great opportunity to, to really consider, you know, how we design things. Because... You know, when we design something and build something, it's around for a long time, you know, at least 50 years, but possibly 100 years or so. Mm. And it has such a huge impact um, on all of us, but very much our health and well-being. There's so much research to show that, you know, the built environment has a deep impact on us um, as, as humans from the biological point of view in terms of physically how we move around the environment and that might be to do with accessibility from a sensory point of view and that might be you know whether we're uh, visually impaired or of hearing but it also might be around issues around hypersensitivity in the built environment so you know we see that say a child or a person with autism would be very um, stressed by by a very um, uh, confusing or, or you know or overly stimulating environment or in fact when we move beyond, say, the biological or the physical and the sensory and we start thinking about cognitive. So we all have our, you know, our cognitive capabilities as well. And that's how we think or problem solve or, or how we, you know, intellectually deal with yeah, the world. But, but before we go back, to, yeah. let's just go back to what you were talking about in, in relation to design. You, you mentioned uh, it's, it's more or less white, white-centric, shall we say. Yeah. So is, is thinking among designers and architects somewhat siloed? 
Uh, it is. Um, and I mightn't be that popular for saying that, but I... Mm. I think, you know, um, they, you know, we all come from a particular cultural perspective. You know, Ireland over the last couple of years has become, you know, much more um, multicultural. But cer- certainly when I was studying architecture, it was very much a class of, you know, white uh, Irish uh, citizens. So and we're, I suppose, a lot of the decision makers and designers now. So it's hard not to be siloed thinking and it's it's hard to break outside disciplines and it's hard to truly work in a kind of an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary way. We all talk about it, but I think it's it's much harder to to do rather than talk about it. Because because you have the, the, the new developed housing estates for the, the new families, right? And yeah. then they have their kids. They get they get uh, better jobs, but better salaried. They move up the line into tree lined middle class estates again or houses, whatever. They get old, their kids go off to work and then they're off to a, they're batched off to a nursing home. So it's it's in three separate stages if you if you if you look at it like that. Yeah, and I think that's <clears throat> That's a consequence of planning, a very kind of a monocultural approach to planning mm. where, you know, where we where we consider a suburban area should be pri- primarily about housing. So we yeah. might put a crash or a school there. We might put some shops. But modernist planning did that. Cities were traditionally very diverse. Um, and we see it in the centres of our, our Irish towns and, and cities and European cities, worldwide cities. They're quite diverse in terms of the activities and, and the stuff that goes on. Modernist planning was was about breaking away from that. It was often driven by efficiency and hygiene. So, you know, to, to take people and move them away from smoke belching factories and, and open sewers was a good thing at the time. But it did create very kind of monocultural or, or single use um, kinds of residential areas. And I still think we're living with that. But wasn't that driven, sorry, Tom, by sort of local and, and central government policy? It is, but I think it, it was probably something we all bought into. I think, um, th- again, when we looked at, say, major reconstruction after the war, when, when a lot of traditional cities, particularly European cities, were damaged, there was an opportunity, you know, through modernism, to design these highly functional cities and highly functional spaces. And that was seen as breaking up uses, putting factories here, yeah. putting schools here, putting c- culture. So that... That was deemed the wisdom of the time, and I still I, that's not that long ago, and we're still living with that kind of wisdom. But has that changed? Yeah, I, I changing. <laughs> I think it's still hard to 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 you know to really mix areas and to really mix um, activities and and kinds of uses, and we still see lots of housing estates being built, particularly I think around our our, our larger towns, which are very monocultural. They're very yeah. two story semi D. Um, and, you know, quite pleasant places to live in many ways. But but it does mean that you get that kind of generational move and the families growing older sure. together at the same time. How do, you, how do you change that, though? I mean, how do you change that sort of uh, social, uh, the, sort of the income and, and also racial um, coming together? OK, um, I, it, I think planning is usually important. Um, I think there is... You know, there are planning instruments there like local development plans, um, local uh, local area plans, um, county development plans that can start mixing those uses. It's about, you know, t- taking a more complex and probably a systems thinking approach to things. We, we know that um, we're all more comfortable in a slightly diverse environment. We all want walkable communities. We all want places with, with playgrounds and creches. Um, um, can, so can I just yeah. ask... I, I just want to challenge you on that. Okay. Is that the reality? Do we feel more comfortable in diverse places? Or is the problem, and a lot of the nimbyism we're seeing at the moment, the fact that we're all very comfortable in places that are very alike and where the people look like us and drive the same cars as us <laughs> and do the same jobs as us? Yeah, yeah, I think you, Carly, might have a, a point there. Um, I, I think that is changing again, though. Mm-hmm. I think we do see people wanting to move to more, to more div- diversity. I don't think we've had the choice, which is yeah. a lot of, with a lot of the cases. I mean, if you're to look at, you know, let's look at, say, villages in Dublin, the mm-hmm. likes of Ranala or, or Rathmines. Or, they're very mixed people, you know, property mm-hmm. prices and so on. People really flock to them. Yeah. But when we're, people, we don't often have that option in terms of diversity. So we our choice is often the kind of mon- monocultural housing estate um, that doesn't have that mix of uses or facilities um, and density. I think there's there's issues around density here as well. There's there's issues around diversity and uses, but there's there's also an intensity that I think can be quite um, vib- vibrant uh, mm-hmm. as a as a kind of a as a dweller in a in an urban environment. So, I think 
in the past, certainly, you know, where I grew up, uh, outside a outside Nina in Tipperary, it was, you know, a kind of a typical kind of ribbon development. So it was mm-hmm. just a bunch of houses along a road and it just kept stretching out and just people built and built. There was very little diversity there. Um, and that was, that's what a lot of people grew up with. So mm-hmm. I think we also have to consider probably in Ireland there is a culture of wanting to live in the countryside. I think a lot of people aspire to... Oh, we've discussed this many, many times on this programme yeah. in, yeah, relation to, I, in relation to the green space. And know. I think it's valid and I think, <clears throat> you know, because I guess it's something we grew up with and it's something we're comfortable, back to the point you're yeah. making about being comfortable with. Um, so a lot of people do aspire to that. But when they're given the opportunity, I think when a lot of people are given the opportunity of well-designed communities with that diversity and mix, mm-hmm. public transport and so on, yeah. people will, will, you know, will vote with their feet. So... But it back to, you know, I guess when you're looking at um, development plans, local area plans and the role of planning is to provide those high quality communities. And we don't have as many exemplars as we should. I think they're arriving. I, I think there's probably... Where would, where would you give examples of where they're arriving, Tom? As about I, you know, f- I think there's places like Adamstown. Is, which, is that, but I, I hear a lot of complaints about Adamstown in terms of infrastructure, in terms of I, people able to get in and out of the place. Yeah, I think it was caught as well in terms of a recession. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It was sure. kind of half yeah, built. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But you can see the idea and you can see the germs of, of where it, where would, it might would, go. Would, does that kind of new town planning work? Because you've also got a lot of uh, sort of quasi cities around the UK as well which plainly aren't working yeah. as well you know? yeah. uh, 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 do they, do they, do, do, does that sort of new town work I, I think there's 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 good examples of it working I think as long as it's 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 well connected um, and integrated into a local community well served with public transport and I guess the likes of Adamstown you're in touching distance of, of Dublin city yeah. centre so there's and I would say Balbriggan would be probably one yeah. of the best examples. Yeah. That's one of Dublin's youngest and fastest growing yeah. But that was towns. already established though as, as a town. I'm talking about completely, completely creating new cities or new towns. Well, when you consider, I mean, you know, Tala was a completely new town. Well, that's, yeah. 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 I mean, Now it went through its difficult uh, times, yes. but I think it's coming out the other side. I think Tala is starting I think to Dublin get bus might disagree with okay, you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, fair enough. It's been in the news but, but again this week. Has, but, yeah. but it was very awkwardly done, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, transplanting all those tenements from, from Garden Street out there and, and they're used to their sitting living yeah. in the rest. Now, whatever about the social yeah. problems, let's yeah, just yeah, regard yeah, those yeah, for now, yeah. okay? There's still, you have those social problems in any, in any, in any uh, parish or townland. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I mean, it was so badly thought out, as was Ballymont. Now, I know we're going way back now, yeah, Ballymont sure, Fast yeah, and yeah, so yeah, forth, yeah, you yeah. know? Yeah. So... You know, and, and I mean, you do see it. I mean, you see it in the UK now, in the US, you know, and other, and other uh, cities around Europe as well, where there is a lack of joined up thinking and racial planning. You've got the, the, the problems in Paris as well. Yeah. You know? And I think Ballymun was probably a classic example mm-hmm. of that post-war planning that was very kind of monocultural or very... Con- um, well, it was still an u- experiment in the UK at the time, wasn't it? Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. all over the world. Like, yeah. like, those kind of blocks were built very unsuccessful, um, largely. Um, there are some good examples, mm-hmm. I think, that, that do work. But again, it's about context um, and it's about how, to, you know, how they're supported by other... Uh, services and facilities but you know uh, there are other examples that are probably a bit quieter when you consider the likes of Crumlin and Drimna and places that were built again people moving out of you know really substandard tenement accommodation in Dublin but at the time they were built they were pretty high density they had good services like schools community halls churches and they uh, and they slowly built a sense of community there now I think there's work to be done in those places still. I think all of these places evolved, but I think they would be a pretty good example of of a new new developments that have actually yeah. worked over time. I'm asking you this uh, because I have uh, I have in mind what I'm what I'm really thinking is about the um, over in the states, for instance. You have the Irish area, the Irish neighbourhood. You have the Italian neighbourhood. Are people pre? Are, are we homogenous in thinking? Do we just like to be in our own income group and our, in our own uh, without without being too racial about it? Yeah, I mean, and I and I think character areas and cities are important. Um, mm-hmm. We have the Grafton Quarter, for instance, the very <laughs> controversial <laughs> the very, Grafton very, very, Quarter. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say anything. No, no, I'm not going to say anything about that. But I, I I think character areas are important. I'm not, you know, I don't think successful urban planning is about is about creating a complete even mix or spread. Oh, I think okay. there are things, you, you know, you you do allow... Within income and, and racial... To exist, yeah. Oh, okay. um, of, of its own accord. In other words, let it grow of its own its Yeah, own there's way. an organic element. An organic we, element. We, I guess we can't yeah. overplan these things either. I mean... Right, right. That's um, interesting now. There are... 
I think it's important not to be too prescriptive of yes. our planning. I think there's yes. a conversation to be had about mm-hmm. yeah. you know taking a kind of that master plan approach and yeah. and and you know giving like an overall envelope or overall uses, but without being absolutely too prescriptive about what's going in there, which can be a bit yeah. Limiting. But I think what Brian is referring to there is really a more societal thing mm. than oh, absolutely. a housing thing because we see it n- not just in Ireland. We see it in every country and in every city and every country in the world that people do tend to group together. And that's at, you know, um, you can look at uh, districts like Chinatown. You can look at, and I can remember in Rathmines, as a matter of interest, when you went to Bolton Street, where did you rent a <laughs> flat? <laughs> Rath Mines? <laughs> yeah. Of course, okay, because and, and, yeah. and how how did I know that? Because every country person, yeah. everybody yeah, yeah. came from a, a rural background, That's rented correct. in Rath Mines. Yeah, yeah. And there's a reason for that. But, you know, and it's exactly the one you've identified. The familiarity and other family members there. And, and because and, other yeah. guys who were living in the town, yeah. to, their parents told your parents yeah. that that was the place to live. And, you know, and that's what happened. And that's also, by the way, why all the rural landlords bought properties yeah. in Rath Mines as well. But if you break that down, and I think that's mm. a good point, and I think allowing that kind of organic development um, is right. And, you know, you can't be too prescriptive about where people live and how they live and so on. But uh, that diversity happens, I think, in places that have that level of density, that have mm. that availability, and you are providing providing people with choice. You don't necessarily get that choice in the kind of monocultural low density housing estate where, you know, different communities and different activities aren't as comfortable living cheek and jowl. Mm. There is something about a slightly higher density urban community that facilitates that in Mm -hmm. a more seamless kind of organic way. Is that right, really? Yeah. Well, I I think that's probably, if you look at suburbs, um, there's a huge difference between, um, you know, the now private but uh, corporation built Mm -hmm. developments compared to the originally private built developments compared to the modern private built developments and if you look in the city centre there there isn't room to do that so actually what we see what we tend to see are people you know uh, building more on infill or going over going, going sure. over retail units um, and, and so that's how you get the greater mix yeah. but I'm not sure that we do that enough in Ireland we have so many empty upstairs over retail no, it's uh, absolutely and I think uh, you know move beyond Dublin and look at all our mm. kind of county towns, um, which have been gutted in many ways by by poor planning and um, by by probably allowing yeah. you know too much kind of retail on on the on the periphery, which draws people out, or yeah. development of big housing estates that kind of suck the heart out of the, out of the town. And I think that's that's a big challenge. I think the the value and 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 the worth of our small towns um, yeah. and our big towns and our villages in terms of providing. The diversity that we're talking about, when you consider, you know, at any town in Ireland 40, 50 years ago, you would have had people living over the shops. You would have had families who grew up. And uh, had are, are we over starting to return so to on. that? I hope. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And actually, do you know, uh, there's a good example in Tipperary that we might come back to after the break. So, OK, stay tuned after the break. We're going to continue discussing this with Tom Gray of uh, Trinity House. Um, stay tuned and we'll come back to this after the break. Your community radio for South Dublin. This is Dublin South FM. Could you and your dog spend one hour per week bringing special moments to people in care centres? Or would you like one of our volunteer visiting teams to come and visit your care centre? At Irish Therapy Dogs, we have a dedicated interest in the use of pet therapy for people in long-term or daily residential care. A professional organisation aimed at providing a pet therapy service on a national basis. If you with your dog would like to get involved or if you would like one of our visiting teams to visit your care centre, then please call us on 01544 6198 or visit irishtherapydogs.ie for more information. Do you need a professional looking website or graphics for your company? Does your current website work on all modern devices such as tablets and smartphones? If not, you are losing business. Preamp Digital Media provides a full range of solutions to give your company the edge in today's digital world. Please visit www.preampdigitalmedia.com for all the information you need. That's www.preampdigitalmedia.com I've always provided. That's what I do. Even when the job shut down, I somehow managed. But the pressure chips away at your confidence. I felt alone. I needed to talk things out. I learned Samaritans, 
isn't just for when you hit rock bottom. I'm glad I called. It's always worth getting problems big and not so big off your chest. Call Samaritans. No pressure, no judgment. We're here for you. Anytime, talk to us. Free call 116 123 or go to samaritans.ie. Broadcasting to South Dublin on 93.9. This is Dublin South FM. And Jimmy, welcome back to Probably Matters here in Dublin South FM with Carl Town and myself, Brian Fox. We have a very good special studio, a very special guest in the studio, excuse me, Thomas. It's Thomas Gray of uh, Trinity House, Trinity College, Dublin. And I just want to talk to you now about, uh, we, at the top of the program, we talked to about you, uh, about uh, design for us. But just let's go a little bit further into this um, because um, you talk about a people-centred design, as we've talked about earlier on, and spatial scales. Talk us, to, talk us through some of the projects that you had, that you're focusing on now. Yeah, OK, so, um, so we, I talked about how we like to concentrate on or, you know, look at designing across that age spectrum. Um, I think it's also very important to, to design across the spatial scales. So our, our work, I guess, would, would go from the smallest, you know, element like a garden up to the larger urban design stuff, which I guess we were discussing a little bit before the break. Um, one of the things that we've, we've really found uh, to be... Uh, an area that needs a lot of attention is around design for people who would have, a, have some form of dementia or a cognitive impairment. Now, they say there's up to 55,000 people in Ireland um, living with a form of dementia and that could double in by 2030, 2040. So we're, when we talk about a person with dementia, we're, we need to consider them um, across a number of levels. Um, particularly, I guess, around the cognitive issues, which I refer to a little a little bit about earlier on a person with a dementia will you know may 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 not be able to orientate themselves in space they may have problems navigating one place to the, to the other they might be a little bit more hypersensitive around um, environmental stimuli such as noise and lights and so on so if we're talking about a lot of people who are out living in a community living at home and so on who are visiting um, shops who are visiting banks who are visiting healthcare care centers such as hospitals and so on I think it's really important that we you know we design um, and take into consider consideration their needs now one of the ways that we're looking at that is underpinning designing for people with dementia with what we call universal design now Ireland is lucky we've got we're one of the only countries with a, a, a statutory agency or centre for universal design which was founded uh, as part of the 2005 Disability Act. So universal design is where you, you know, you're designing for all ages, sizes, abilities and disabilities. And of course, designing for dementia fits within that remit. So that's quite a nice framework to underpin. So we apply that lens then to a number of, of settings within the built environment. I mentioned gardens. We've done a lot of work around, you know, creating therapeutic and supportive outdoor spaces for people living with dementia, whether it's in their home or whether it's in care homes or hospitals. Um, interestingly enough, we had the opportunity to um, present two gardens at the Bloom Festival in Phoenix Park, uh, two, two year, one year after the other, and that was a really good way, I think, of, of communicating that message. Can you give us a little bit of detail about what that, w um, what would it look like? What are the important elements of that? In terms of the garden? Or yeah. Je okay, so, um, so if we refer back to the needs that a person might have uh, around orientation, about wayfinding, about anxiety, um, then we want to create a comforting, orientating space that's calm and gives them a sense of security. So the gardens that we were looking at, one garden was just taking a person's back garden. So a typical mm -hmm. garden in a suburban house in, in Dublin, as our example. Now, sadly, what often happens with many older people and particularly a person with, with some kind of a disability like dementia is told, you know, you really you shouldn't be going outside anymore because you might trip going out the step. Being outside is dangerous. And it's probably the one thing within their home um, that would offer them an awful lot of kind of therapeutic activities and so on. So if you can provide some kind of a space that a person can go outside, can do normal things like gardening, um, normal things like um, sitting, reading outside, then you're offering them so much because it's a multi-sensory activity. We all know gardens can have flowers and, and shrubs and so on, which have a nice scent and are tactile and so on. And that will stimulate a person in a, in a, person in a very gentle way. Um, but it also gives them a safe and, and kind of calm activity to do by themselves or with a loved one or a family member. So that, that, that often provides an outlet that a person might lose 
you know, that now they shouldn't, but oftentimes our mm-hmm. communities aren't designed in a way to cater for their needs. So, you know, there is they might be restricted from moving out and about in the community. So providing a safe therapeutic space for them that's just outside their back door or their kitchen patio door is a really marvellous thing to be able to do. It makes so much sense when you say it. Yeah, but again, we got, got back to it. I'm going to cite the problem to you. For mm. instance, yeah, you probably know about this, Tom, in Shankill. We have St. Joseph's there, yeah. which, is a, which, is a day, which is a centre for yeah. people with dementia yeah. and a day centre as well. And they're not threatened, well, the day centre anyway, is threatened with closure and with layoffs because of the funding from the lack of funding from HSC. So, I mean, it all, it all depends on that as well, doesn't it? Oh, it, it does. Um, <coughs> I think, you know, when we consider the kind of ecosystem, essentially, of health yes. care that we yeah. need in the yeah. community. Yeah. To, yeah. Well, that's, that's a very good point. And, I, and I think that's really necessary. Yeah. And I think the likes of daycare, respite, mm. um, rehabilitation, uh, primary health care, mm. GPs that can, you know, that, that can cater to people like, you know, have those kinds of needs. The more systems and structures we have in place, the longer people can remain living at home for as long as possible. And that is the aim, isn't it? It is the aim. Um, we know that the worst place in the world for a person, for, 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 for a lot of us, but particularly an older person with a dementia, is in an acute hospital setting. So that brings us, I guess, to one of our other research areas, which looking at the hospital setting. Um, and we know that up to 29% of people in a, in a hospital setting will have some form of cognitive impairment. Now, many people are staggered by that. They, you know, nearly a third of people, nearly a third of patients in a hospital will have some form of cognitive impairment. Is that over a certain age or is that in general? Um, No, in general, because, you know, hospitals will typically cater for an older population. Um, So we've done work with the likes of Tala Hospital, back to our discussion around Tala. And Tala has, you know, an ageing demographic because I guess it was built at a certain time. Lots of people moved out from from the younger folk at the time and and now they're older. And now they're reaching a certain certain age. So, you know, Tala Hospital would would have a big proportion of its patients and also visitors and so on who would have um, some form of cognitive impairment, whether it's a dementia or something like that. So designing for them to make sure that they can use that facility, whether it's an outpatients department, emergency department and so on, is really important. But really important that they're not in there for, you know, four and five and possibly weeks on end, which happens with a lot of people, Mm -hmm. because there isn't the likes of the, the step down or the respite facilities within the community. So people are are offered a pretty stark choice in terms of infrastructure. You're, you know, you're at home or you're in hospital or you're in long term residential care. Mm. And, and that doesn't take into consideration um, the degenerative nature of this. So absolutely. as in there's going to be a big difference, maybe year one diagnosis yep. as year four or five or six diagnosis. Yeah, that's correct. And I think, you know, you need to build in that kind of flexibility and adaptability mm-hmm. to, to cater to that. But there are so many good examples um, around the world um, and in Ireland that we're starting to look at how you can design for for people with a dementia, keeping them at home in their community, keeping them at home in their house, um, but also when they need then to enter healthcare, particularly acute setting like a hospital, that it's there to support them. Um, and that it's appropriate. It's but appropriate. H- well, I wish a HSE policy, because in the, but Department of Health policy at the moment is sort of going, going against that, isn't it, in terms of cares and so forth, and, and, and the way that's all so confused at the moment as well. Um, because, you know, obviously the emphasis on keeping elderly people at home, whereas they're trying to revise that whole whole carer side at the moment from the yeah. point of the legislation. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, I think that's true. Um, and say, if you look at it from the, the point of view we come from in terms of the built environment, um, there are issues around where people are living and maybe bringing us back to communities, the kind of more monocultural communities where people don't have access to public transport or people don't have are within walking distance of a local shop or their GP or whatever. Yeah. So it kind of ties us back to the discussion I think we were having it before does. the break it that, yeah, yeah. You, know, d- you know, creating these more div- diverse um, communities that have those kinds of supports, like the Irish towns we talked about yeah. in the past, yeah. Yeah. or like parts of our cities, at towns and villages that where people can remain living at home and there's stuff on their doorstep. Um, there is a well-known phenomenon for all of us as we age that for most people our, our kind of our distance that we travel out or kind of life distance as it's called can shrink um, so we're not as e- it's not as easy for us to get into the car and drive big distances or uh, you know handle complex public transport systems so 
the more um, the more community facilities that are within striking distance, that are within a 10 or 15 minute walk for older people is really important. But, but Tom, isn't this all very nice? We're talking like this, but, on, you know, in terms of, of, of policy, uh, a government that only lasts five years. So, I mean, you're, you're not going to get proper... Uh, um, continuous policy in relation to yeah. your, 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 your type of uh, thinking on planning. Yeah, well, I think there's been progress. Um, As there, yeah. There's a very, I think, one of the best pieces of policy that has come out over the last couple of years around ageing, but it's very integrated thinking is 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 a kind of a cross-departmental um, policy housing options for our older population. Um, and it's it's a joint and, and kind of cross cross departmental initiative to look at you know what we can do to keep people uh, or to provide the right kinds of housing for people as they get older and it's founded on a number of principles the first one is aging in place how do we keep people living at home as much as possible but another important one and I think this is where joined up thinking is finally starting to come through is that you can also um, build that or factor factor that into regeneration. So back to what we're talking about, our towns and parts of our cities and suburbs that that actually need some form of regeneration. So how do we use housing, particularly for a group like older people, to regenerate? So one of the best examples in in Ireland, um, and certainly it has become an international exemplar, is the Macaulay Place in Nace. So you have Nace, um, county town, um, Kildare County town, um, but large tracts of the centre of the town have become, you know, almost derelict and, and certainly, um, uh, you know, not developed to their capacity at all, um, hollowed out to some extent. And you have an organisation like Macaulay Place who who took over an old monastery building and are slowly kind of turning it into a very kind of exciting um, hub um, in the middle of the town. Now it has, you know, they've built, very successfully built I think it's about 50 apartments that are primarily for yeah. older people. But out of that has grown a coffee shop, a restaurant, a health centre, a community garden. And, and that's real regeneration. But they're massively um, encouraging of the community coming in. Uh, oh, absolutely. So yeah. I happen to know that our producer took dance classes there a number of years ago while, you know, I, I sat in the coffee shop and I remember uh, there's a financial advisor comes in and give, gives monthly talks to all of the community. Absolutely. So whether you're a first time buyer yeah. or somebody worried about pensions or something. And that to me is true commu- community use. Like, so actually, you're right. I think that's probably the exemplar. It's a great that's ex- vision, though, as well. It though, is vision. It? Um, and there was a couple of visionaries in- involved. Yeah. Um, there was a very impressive lady, um, Margarita Salon, who was involved. Um, I kind of, when would be a very interesting person to get in here and mm. talk to you someday but you know we've worked quite closely with her on some projects and she you know she spoke about her own future and she said that um, you know a couple of like minded people in Nay said well where would we like to live when we get older um, and it's back to this kind of maybe downsizing or right sizing mm-hmm. phenomenon but Nace as well is a even though it's a market town um, you would still have a lot of population that maybe live out with yeah. uh, outside of walking distance of the town yeah. uh, that maybe you know they're not well serviced by public transport so aging would be a very real concern there a real concern there um and i think people you know it's funny we spoke earlier about you know our comfort zones and mm. and maybe we're irish people are culturally quite comfortable and a lot of the residents of Macaulay place did live in your traditional kind of suburban parts of nace and it, so it was a bit of a leap of faith i think for them mm. to move into kind of the, the heart of nace and mm. live in an apartment scheme essentially mm. Mm. Um, but I, it's been wildly successful um it has really married um a couple of elements that we're really interested in in our research was how you bring housing, ageing and urbanism together and how you can use one thing to leverage the other. We often think about housing for older people as a challenge, as a problem. We think it's a great opportunity. I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you from your research... Uh, what is the, the what is the majority attitude to elderly parents and so forth? Is it a there a problem? Let's get let's get it out of the way. I, I think I think that's still the, the attitude, yeah, and yeah. I still think we all um, there is an unfortunate lack of choice. We spoke about that earlier on. So I think people are often forced into into care homes. Now I think um, there are some really good care homes and nursing homes I- in Ireland, um, and I think they're but properly planned. Um, yeah, I, I think there are some issues. There's not as I think planning around care homes and, and nursing homes hasn't been integrated enough. Um, and I think 
there's the housing policy we spoke about earlier on has a, an action in there around long term residential care saying where do we put it where's the optimum yeah. location I think that's really important so the the idea of bringing these things together and seeing aging and housing um, as an opportunity um, is very important we we know that there's a thing called the grey dollar where people have yeah. money on their hands <clears throat> and they have a bit more time in their hands they're a majority of the volunteers are older mm. retired people. So, you know, you bring those people, you provide those people with, you know, the right kind of accommodation in our towns that need that level of regeneration. They're going to be a really powerful uh, asset, I think, to the, our community. I think you're absolutely right. But how are we leveraging that asset? Are we bringing them in um, under the public consultation, guys? Are we, are we doing enough in terms of community engagement? You know, how are we capturing that voice? Yeah, we're not. Uh, I think that's that's an issue. Um, I think um, it's not seen as as probably a realistic option for, for a lot of people. I, I, I think people have to go down a long road um, in terms of forming a housing association or something like that, which is what they have to do. But even feeding place. into even feeding into something like planning um, to enable small solutions, because we've spoken a lot, you know, about maybe some of the strategic and policy mm-hmm. things. But if we bring this down to an individual level for people in their own homes, you know, has your research looked into what individuals can do in their in their own homes in terms of that kind of design? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So one of the projects we did in 2015 was looking at um, how you make ordinary dwellings, people's private dwellings, how how you make them age and and back to the idea around being dementia friendly. Um, now that was a project that was sponsored by the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design. So we took that approach, that inclusive universal design approach. But that was really about what are the small things we can do in our in our homes and in our gardens and in our communities and to keep people at home. What kind of things came up? Um, there's a lot of the the stuff you'd expect, like you know, um, you know, providing accessible bathrooms and you know stairs and handrails and sort of so a lot of the stuff that you would expect. In terms of wayfinding uh, within the home, wayfinding within a home can be handled at lots of levels. Um, um, it can be as simple as you know providing signage or 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 you know it sounds odd to be providing signage in a home, but one of Not the things all, no. one of the things we we find uh, with. With all of us, as we get older, is in memory and, of course, and yeah. cognitive yeah. impairment. That if you, you know, if you literally don't know where the tea is kept in the press, you know, but you, you know, mm. it, it's you're not remembering at that moment, or you have issues about where, where actually where the bathroom is. Simple signage like bathroom, kitchen signage, labeling things to say this is tea, this is coffee. These are very simple acts that can actually allow a person support what we call their activities of daily living, which is the normal stuff like cooking, eating, dressing yourself, going to the toilet and so on. So, yeah, wayfinding in the home, it might sound like a kind of a foreign idea. That's something mm. we do on streets or in big airports or hospitals. But I think it can be done at home to keep people um, yeah. orientate people in their own houses. Yeah, no, these are things that are very important. Um, so we're going to take a short break now. We're going to come back to the studio with Tom Gray from Trinity House. And when we come back after the break, we'll talk about people-centred design and what the private sector needs to take away from this in terms of design principles. Things fine on 93.9 Dublin South FM. Oh, will you look at them go? I wish I had their energy. Ah, they're good for the soul though, aren't they? I can't imagine life without Lucky, (laughs) but he might outlive me yet. Oh, (laughs) well, take my advice and sign up for a Dogs Trust Canine Care card. It's completely free and it's given me such peace of mind since I did. What's that? Well, it's simple, really. It means if you pass away before Lucky, Dogs Trust will take him in and give him the care and love he needs until they match him with the perfect forever home. That sounds terrific. How much did you say it costs? It doesn't cost a cent. Great. How do I sign up? Just text CARE to 50100 and they'll call you with more information. Or you can go to dogstrust.ie. Well, that's wonderful advice. I'll do that right away. (coughs) Here, Lucky. (coughs) Good boy. Whatever loan you're looking for, wedding loans, holiday loans, car or home improvement loans, make sure you talk to your local Capital Credit Union, where there are no hidden charges or early repayment penalties on your loan. Loans subject to approval, terms and conditions apply, Capital Credit Union Limited, regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Senior Line is a confidential telephone service for older people. 
Free phone 1800 80 45 91. We're open every day of the year from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., including Christmas Day and New Year. So it's free phone 1800 80 45 91. We're there if you need someone to talk to and need someone to listen. We're older people too, so we will understand, and we're very good at listening. Did you get the senior line number? It's free phone 1800 80 45 91. Your community radio for South Dublin. This is Dublin South FM. And in studio, still with us is Thomas Gray of Trinity College, of Trinity House, excuse me, Trinity College, Dublin. Okay, Tom, before we went to the break there, we were just talking about um, many of the design principles. And, you know, again, this is an industry show. We speak to the industry. Like, what does the, what do developers and um, private contractors need to understand? You know, what are the design principles that need to be brought in? Uh, you know, we don't want to be delivering age-friendly homes as a as a separate category. I mean, these are, as you say, universal design principles. We need to get better at designing homes that suit at various times in the life in our lives. What are there a set of guiding principles to le- lean to? Yeah, uh, I so we talked a little earlier about um, some of the dementia-friendly design work mm-hmm. we did. Uh, one of the one of the things that really interested me, uh, coming from you know having been in architecture practice and having been uh, you know worked in that area for a while, was when I came to the area of dementia friendly design. I, I was a little bit concerned initially. I thought, is this very, is it kind of very niche, or is it you know are are we kind of looking at a very narrow part of society? But very quickly we find when we start looking at the research that when you design for older people and particularly a, a person with a cognitive impairment you really raise the bar so you know designing for for that group of people we find is also really good for all the rest of us it, it makes very good child-friendly communities it makes very good um, supportive communities for disabilities and so on so there's an advantage to thinking like this there's a kind of a market advantage so it's not only about designing for people uh, older people or people with disabilities this this is something that I think um, private uh, maybe develop, developers and the construction industry should really embrace and not to be afraid of. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are going to be some challenges. There are going to be some additional costs. However, when you do this kind of thing from the beginning, the costs can be absolutely minimal. It's when you start retrofitting mm. that that's where the costs mm-hmm. come in. Now, we have, a, we have a large and old building stock we need to retrofit. So, obviously, that that's one element. But we're talking about... Um, major refurbishment or we're talking about new build going forward when we start to incorporate a kind of a universal design approach um, into that um, it you know it really opens up a market for people and we see funny enough how you know when we look at um, the likes of the Dundrum shopping centre or you know uh, a lot of kind of commercial premises they, you know, make it as accessible and as easily used for as many people as possible because they just want to get customers in the door. I think we need to start thinking about, you know, housing and healthcare in our cities in the same way. Remove as many of these kind of physical barriers as possible and, and make them as, as accessible and usable for the widest cohort. And it's going to just make a more valuable um, product or built environment. Yeah, and that needs to extend beyond the house. It actually needs to extend, or the the house or the apartment, it needs to be the entire development, whether it's the footpaths, the the way on to public transport routes. Yeah, that's for sure. I think it, it you need that kind of linked thinking. There's, you know, we talk about the the, the travel chain. Um, you know, when you go from your bedroom into your bathroom, into your kitchen and out the door onto a bus or into your car, and if one link of that chain is broken then it can be a major obstacle for a lot of people. And we, we often see that we have pockets of good practice, but taking that kind of integrated approach to planning and design is really essential that we, we provide as a seamless as journey as possible. I came out here tonight on the Lewis. I could have come here, um, well, most stations, whether I'm wheeling a, a buggy on with a baby, whether I'm rolling on if I'm, if I'm using a wheelchair, a stroller, if I'm pulling a piece of luggage, this, this isn't just about people with disabilities or older people. This, this, you can see how good design caters to all of us. It makes products, services and buildings um, more attractive and more useful and people enjoy using it a lot more. I think it's interesting when you say we've got pockets of great design because I think that that's exactly the way to describe it. And I think both in public and private sector, we've got 
pockets of great design. So there are elements of the public area around Dublin City and, and Dublin County. That's fantastic. Uh, you know, right down to our smart benches and our sensory gardens and green areas. And then we've got areas that yeah. just aren't. And, you know, I mean, I, under, obviously there's a resources issue. But in terms of planning, you know, and um, local area plans and our master plan, is this something that do you feel planners are aware of or or give their significance to? Um, I think they're becoming more aware of it. Um, I think it's, you know, planning is a complex role. You're you're trying to tie a lot of ends together. You're trying to keep an awful lot of people happy. You're, you're dealing with transport, utilities, rainwater. You're dealing with a lot of things. Um, so it is it is a kind of a very challenging pursuit. But I think the more policies we see, like the housing options mm-hmm. for our ageing population, which takes that kind of integrated approach and recognises and identifies the fact that it can't be about pockets of excellence, that you can't have, you know, you can't successfully uh, uh, house people and expect people to operate in the community if you're only providing a really nice development. But the minute they step outside it, mm-hmm. then they run into all kinds of obstacles. Or that it's just not a friendly and, and conducive environment. I think, you know, we can provide um, all the services and public transport in the world, but I think our urban spaces also need to be uh, friendlier to us. They need to be more human kind of centred. They need to be somewhere conducive for us to spend time. I think they're an important, the public realm, mm-hmm. you know, when we talk about the public realm, it's, you know, everything that's open to the public, streets, squares, but also into public buildings. But that kind of how deep is the research feeding into this? You know, really what I'm wondering you know, we don't want to be designing based on a set of assumptions mm. that work for some people and, yeah. and, and not for others. You know, again, you know, I, I don't want to kind of keep beating the drum of public consultation, but even in terms of um, engaging with medical professionals or people from um, like uh, the care sector, you know, how deep is the research going in that's, that's actually, um, I, I suppose, really guiding this information? Yeah. Well, I think we're back to pockets again. Mm, okay. <laughs> and it's, it is happening in, in certain places and in certain um, and in certain um, sections of planning and urban design and architecture and so on uh, there's to be honest there's just not an ingrained culture okay. of collaboration so there's a resistance of some design. description you would, uh, would you resistance, suggest but, I mean, you know when I'm studying mm. architecture and architecture at a minimum is five years but it can be a lot longer mm-hmm. we didn't discuss collaboration and co-design and co-productions all of the words that are being thrown around now you know a lot of professionals are you know, you're you're you grow up and you're educated to think that you're the expert. Yeah. Um, and to to reach out to people and to accept a kind of a, a, a community wisdom, in some way undermines your profession. So I think we need to get around that. Now I think that is changing. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of built environment professionals are starting to realise that you know, um, really high quality design comes from that level of collaboration and cooperation with people, um, and it gives mm-hmm. it a richness. But only if you have the mechanisms in place to do it, because, you know, one uh, urban planner might not pick up the phone to, again, a healthcare professional. So you you need to have the systems in place for that to happen. You know, we talk a lot about siloed thinking and and siloed activities for Mm. uh, across the built environment. And there's a reason why they happen. You know, it's because. People are so focused on their problem and solving their problem, knowing that it's important across the value chain of the built environment. But are there any mechanisms for designers to, you know, make contact with medical professionals, to make contact with, you know, um, the care workers and local authorities? Yeah, um, there there are some in, interesting initiatives out there. Mm-hmm. We're we're part of one initiative called. And it, it relates very much, I suppose, to our healthcare stuff. Um, and it's largely American organization that, that we've uh, we've met and encountered called Clinicians for Design. And it's interesting um, because I think this applies to, to all sectors. Basically, what they're saying is that, you know, clinicians, whether it's doctors, nurses, any kind of healthcare staff are often left out of the design process of for healthcare settings because for a number of reasons, they themselves don't have the design skills and the design language to take part. Awareness? Awareness, I think, mm-hmm. or they're not given the space and time. They're hectic jobs, like, you know, mm-hmm. like everybody else. So the idea that they would become, you know, a productive part of a design team um, is is kind of alien. So, you know, we, we see situations where very expensive healthcare facilities are designed and built without asking the 
the experts that are going to work in them, whether it's the, the consultants, the doctors, nurses, whoever it is, who are going to operate them on a day-to-day basis. So this interesting organisation, Clinicians for Design, is, mm-hmm. is looking at kind of bringing clinicians and healthcare, the healthcare sector into design, giving them some of the tools and bringing those two worlds together, the, the design world and the healthcare. And I think we need to think about that not just in healthcare, but in terms of education. Yeah. Do we sit down with our yeah. teachers yeah. and our principals enough or our early childhood um, practitioners and say, right, you tell me, you've been working in kindergartens and creches and preschools for 25 years. You tell me what you need. I don't think we do that. I don't That's think a really interesting point, you know, for things even like there. schools. And all. Well, it's back to your point, isn't it, again, of consultation. Yeah, but, but even, um, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I'm always thinking of things in terms of engaging with the community because yeah. there's a placemaking principle that says yeah. the community knows yeah. best and there's a huge amount of wisdom in that but actually when you take it a step further into industry um, it makes sense clinicians for design that makes absolute sense but actually when you speak about schools of course principals and school teachers know exactly what their school needs yeah. you know so you're right this should be how we design at the other end of the, the age spectrum I suppose in terms of our work we We very recently completed a a set of design guidelines, um, again, that was funded by the Centre for Excellence in Excellence Universal Design and the Department of Children and Youth Affairs. And that was led by Early Childhood Ireland, who are are a group that, you know, coordinate a lot of of the early childhood sector in the country. And that also came on the back of a a very good piece of policy called First Five, which looked at uh, taking a very integrated approach to um, early childhood education in Ireland. And, and again, I suppose from our perspective, it's great to see um, policy really taking on board the built environment. That did not happen for a long time. They were seen as a totally separate world. So now, now we see the likes of the housing policy for older people saying, right, we need to really build the built environment into this. We see the early years and the first five policy saying, we need to create child-friendly cities. We need to create... Um, early childhood settings like creches and, and, and preschools that, that are supportive of families and of children. That kind of thinking I don't think was there a couple of years ago. No, no, that's very, uh, that's yeah. really interesting. Have you ever heard of that first five? No, I have not. No, no. no but it's also very interesting too because of the, the, the Bus Connects uh, project as yeah. well, mm. which has changed due to public yeah. consultation. Yeah, yeah. You know? And I think looking at some of the commentary um, on that, which which I think demonstrates a challenge around consultation, in that oftentimes the the the, the consultants, the designers, whatever, it's seen as a weakness if people are yes. taking faults. I, I was just going to, uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, the the experts yeah. should be experts, right? Yeah, yes. And, and so if people are coming <clears throat> in with really good suggestions, um, then that's seen as a flaw. So I saw some of the feedback from the BuzzConnect team that I thought was really, really relevant to this conversation. Um, so there was some criticism about the initial draft saying God if the local community can spot these problems yes. why do we have you up guys on board and they responded by saying is that not exactly what public yeah, consultation yeah, is yeah, about yeah, yeah. are we not supposed to bring out a draft and are people not supposed to point us to the flaws and weak strengths and weaknesses and then we revise it if we don't revise it then we're called arrogant so uh, it's a difficult one and um, people still expect you know their experts to be perfect um, but yet at the same time want to consult with them which is so ironic given that our planning process it's a public function yeah. so actually you know at least once a year you know I, we put out uh, we put out information and media pieces trying to encourage members of the public to get involved to make them understand that actually when you criticise the planning process you're actually criticising yourself because yeah. as a member of the public you're a, you're a part of the planning process and I think what we need to do is um, really facilitate people when they want to engage and the tools and technologies are there to do that but there's a huge trust issue and you know when we started looking at the area of public consultation in the last number of years you know we assumed that um, the public might distrust developers and we assumed that developers might distrust the local authority planners what we didn't what we didn't understand was how much the developers distrusted the public. Yeah. And that, that yeah. was kind of eye-opening to yeah. us. Um, you know, and it really showed that there's been a breakdown for what actually are, in many cases, local businesses. Mm. So there's a trust element to do this as well. There is, um, and I think there's a trust element and there's almost like a language element. I think, mm-hmm. you know, we, mm. we our silos are based on our kind of, our language, our technical speak. Jargon. And we're jar- and we're very comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course. put a group of architects in a room and yeah. you need someone, yeah. an interpreter at times. Uh-huh. The same with medical people, the same with planners, uh-huh. the same with whatever. 
because it's 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 a badge in many ways, yeah. and I, and I think we we get locked into that. So that I think that's a a bit of a conformer breakdown. In but I I think Trinity House has done a great job in that um in making this accessible. So can you just point people in the direction where they can find your research online? Because there's so much there's too much for us to go into over sixty minutes. But I really want people to be able to access it themselves. Okay, so um, you can go to our website, which is www.trinityhouse.tcd.ie. So if you Google Trinity House, as in the Bauhaus with a H-A-U-S, I didn't come up with a name, so don't <laughs> slag me about it. Um, but if you literally, if you Google Trinity House, you'll get our website and you'll get a lot of the research there and a lot of the projects we've been involved with. That was a great hour, I must say. Very, very interesting indeed. That was Thomas Gray, a research fellow at Trinity House Trinity College Dublin. Thanks for joining us, Tom. You can get in touch with us by email, hello at iPropertyRadio.com or on Twitter at at iPropertyRadio. Okay, and that's it from us in studio today. Again, thank you, Tom, for being with us and also thanks to producer Katie Tallon and Adam Duke on sound. We're back at the same time next week from Brian Fox and myself, Carol Tallon. Have a great week. 